his 2011 book, The Checklist Manifesto, Atul Gawande uh, sort of talked pretty positively about the power of checklists, that a checklist uh, can be really important in healthcare. And if you've been in a hospital recently, there's a very good chance at some point there was a checklist, and I think that has a lot to do with Gawande's influence on the way we do healthcare. His idea was when you're very precise and very clear, it can help save lives. And he said the simple checklist, and his TED talk about this, the simple checklist can save thousands of lives, billions of dollars. And so we talked a lot about checklists in education. We were talking about them before I read Gawande's work, and it was a great validation to read what he said, because I, I think if you can't be clear on what you're trying to explain, it's, it kind of goes without saying, but unless, unless I can explain it clearly, the other person is not going to know how to do it. So as a coach, you're often explaining strategies, and we would argue checklists are really helpful for a number of reasons. The first thing is, to create the checklist, you have to develop a deep understanding so you can synthesize and simplify the practices. If you don't know it deeply enough, you can't create a simple checklist that's clear and easy to follow. And knowledge that isn't clear and easy to follow isn't particularly helpful. We want actionable knowledge, stuff people can put into play right away. And the checklist addresses what uh, Heath and Heath refer to as the curse of knowledge, our tendency to forget what it's like not to know something when we know it really well. That can interfere with our ability to be clear because we're skipping over stuff that's important. And sometimes we just forget. Or sometimes in the kind of excitement of explaining things, we can jump through things pretty quickly. The checklist slows us down and makes us really clear, deals with what I like to call the curse of forgetting, and it deals with the curse of knowledge, and it helps us stay with the person as we describe the strategy. At the same time, though, sometimes people resist checklists because it sounds overly simplistic or reductionist. And so what I would say, it also sounds like you're going to tell me exactly what to do, and I'm a professional, and my classroom's complex, and it doesn't... It doesn't fit into a simple little thing with the lists and boxes and checklists. And so that's why I say we need to be precise through the use of a checklist, but we also need to be provisional, which is to say we share the checklist in a way that honors the capacity of the professional we're working with to make decisions about what they do in their classroom. And so we say, let's just go through this and you tell me what you think. Would you like to do it like this? Do you want to modify it? And then if the teacher says, I'd like to do it in a way that's never going to work, <laughs> I want to butcher this checklist. Uh, then I would say, is it all right with you if I share some thoughts I have? I share my thoughts. I don't try to talk the teacher into what they're going to do. I just say, here's one thought. What do you think about this? I honor the capacity of the teacher to think for themselves and to make their own decisions. And the reality is, <laughs> they're going to do what they're going to do anyway. Just because I tell them doesn't mean they're going to do it. In fact, me telling them would probably decrease the likelihood they're going to do it. So to say, well, let's go through it. Here's what I think. What do you think? Let's adapt it. And if you have a goal to guide the coaching process, then it doesn't matter really if the teacher makes adaptations. If you hit the goal, great. If not, come back to the checklist and look at it. One final sort of benefit of using checklists is when you have a checklist, it becomes a third thing, kind of a third point for dialogue. So the teacher and I, sitting beside each other, we go through it, and it's not me telling him or her what to do. We just sit down and we go through it, and I say, do you want to keep it this way? Do you want to modify it? It's very clear, it's very precise, it's also adapted by the teacher, and it's owned by them. And to think that I could tell them what to do and they're going to do it, it's probably not going to work. The reality is people will do what they do. And using the checklist just gets that back and forth conversation out there where we can see it. So I think uh, in change, in education, precision and provisionality are really important. It's really important that I'm crystal clear. They can't do it unless I explain it. It's also important that I honor the ability of the professional to think for themselves. I'm provisional. I offer things, but I offer them almost more like questions and statements. And when I do that, ironically, they're more likely to do what's on the checklist anyway.